Um, thanks for joining everyone. Uh, today we are having a session on Catalytic. Catalytic is a digital process automation platform. I was talking to Sean yesterday and he was talking about his journey when he didn't even know about RPA or even DPA, I think so. Uh, and he started doing it and it, he just saw that as one of the pain areas uh, within business um, and he started automating things. Um, and you know, then people started classifying it's an RPA and now he, they position themselves as a DPA because they think it's closer to, to a DPA platform. But all in all, it's a very <clears throat> easy to use um, automation platform. Um, so I wanted to see how that works. Um, so uh, today we'll have Sean, uh, who is the CEO and co-founder of uh, Catalytic. Uh, he will be walking us through um, some of the salient points about Catalytic. And then we have Nasir, who would be doing a demo. And then, as usual, we have questions from you all. Uh, so we'll take that as well as some live questions if we have some time. So over to you, Sean. Quick intro. Uh, as Anandan said, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Catalytic. Prior to Catalytic, I had helped start another company called Field Glass, uh, which we began in 2000 and sold to SAP in 2014 for about a billion dollars. Um, and so that was a very successful journey. It was a great startup story. Uh, and when I left SAP, one of the things I wanted to do was to focus entirely on something that I was just like personally passionate about, not, not something that I did just because, you know, I, I felt like I had to do it. And if you ever meet me or if we spend any time together, you will quickly learn that I'm like a productivity geek and I'm an efficiency geek operationally, organizationally. So when I thought about what I wanted to do, it was, all, I knew I wanted to focus on making operations as efficient as humanly possible, or as we ultimately found out, not even humanly possible. So just efficient, period, all right? And, and that's really the catalytic journey. We started with this simple idea of how do we build something from ground up starting in 2016, unencumbered by any existing technologies to be able to make operations as efficient as possible. And we'll show you the end result of what we built as we went through this journey. So I'll just provide a few quick things that you won't necessarily gather in the demo that I think will just provide a little bit of context as we do the demo. It'll be pretty fast. Um, the way we position ourselves is a no-code cloud platform for digitizing operations. We're really focused on uh, helping our customers gain greater visibility, predictability, and efficiency in their operations. And we're going to focus on three different things uh, that are, I think of as pillars to the way we think about a product and our company and essentially our value proposition to customers. One is all around the idea that the only way to make meaningful, significant impact to a large company or to a small company is by empowering a larger number of people to help with the digitization and transformation initiatives. We've been talking about that for a long time. We've been talking about transformation for a long time. We've actually made very little progress. You know, and we've talked about low code for a long time. And I think most of those promises have not come through. And we hope that we can show you a platform like ours that is actually delivering on that. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the slide only because we're gonna show it other than to call out the fact that our goal is no code and is to bring advanced technologies in a easy to consume package. All right, so the, um, the, the idea of no code then becomes like, what are you actually building? And on our platform, we really focus on the, the key things that happen, kind of the 80, 20% rule that happen on the most processes. So we divide all of our functionality into six different categories that are broadly talking to people, systems, and data. So for people, we have tasks and forms. For systems, we have integrations in the form of built-in connectors or universal connectors, like working with SFTP, APIs, stuff like that. We have browser automation for working with web apps and websites. And then on the data side, we have really three categories. One is things that help you put together documents, whether it's a spreadsheet, PowerPoint presentation, it could be a financial report, it could be a contract. Et cetera. And then we have a lot of action functionality in our category around data processing that are essentially ways to take spreadsheet type logic out of spreadsheets and emails and put it into something that's actually a 
cloud-based digital solution. And then the last set of capabilities around text analysis. And this is really used by our customers to help take a lot of their unstructured data and structure it so that it can be used within other parts of the process. So last thing I'll mention here is ultimately this has to come together in the form of providing visibility to operators. Um, if I don't understand what's happening, if I don't have any visibility into what's happening, then I run the risk of silent failures. I have no way to improve things. So we're very obsessed about making sure that you have full real-time visibility into your operations and that we're using machine learning to drive automated insights so that you can drive, so that you can really power continuous improvement initiatives. So that's it. I will stop hand things over to Nasser so that we can kind of jump into the product. Um, but if you have any questions, you know, type them in the chat and after the, after the demo, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll dig into those. Yes, sir. Thank you, Sean. Great. Thanks, Sean. Let me go ahead and start sharing. Yeah, I can see your screen. Great. Thank you. Uh, so before we dive into a specific type of demo uh, around a use case or something like that, what I thought would be helpful is just to baseline everybody on the different elements of the platform itself, uh, such as our homepage and the different verbiage we use. And really what we, what we wanted to do today is just guide you through what that type of building experience really looks like. Uh, we've mentioned low code, no code a couple of times. So let's really see what that looks like and how we leverage those different elements of the platform that Sean was just walking us through. Uh, so when you log into Catalytic, this is your home page. Uh, as Sean was mentioning earlier, we have the ability to keep people in the loop throughout the different workflows that you are now automating. So whether you need somebody to review a piece of information, manage an es escalation or manage an exception, we assign what we call tasks to those types of steps. And up here in this bucket called my tasks, it's again letting me know that there are five of those that are assigned to me where I again need to do something within a workflow, whether it's review a piece of information, manage an exception or escalation. If I start to scroll down, I can start to see a running list of those different types of tasks that are assigned to me. I can click on view all and it'll take me to the full list of all those different ones that are there uh, for me to review. The other thing I wanna point out here on this home screen are the instances I started and instances I'm participating in. All instances really mean are those active workflows that are currently running within my environment. So it's letting me know, hey, that there are seven active workflows that are currently running, whether I kick those processes off myself, or there's a task assigned to me where again, I now need to do something. If I scroll down again, you can see a running list of those instances and where they are within the progress of that process. So how many steps have completed, how many are still outstanding, what is left to be done. Those are all there uh, for you to review. If I click on view all, again, I'll get a full list of all of the different active workflows in my environment. Uh, from here, I'm going to hop over into our workflows page. So workflows are just our own internal branding around any of those process automations that I'll live within Catalytic. So anytime you've created a process and you have the full end-to-end -end process mapped out or, or, or orchestrated here, you have the ability now to have them all stored in a library of processes. And as you can see here, they might be across the board in different lines of businesses, across job functions. So really the ability to impact the business from any uh, department or any group is, is the takeaway. Um, even though all of these processes might live here in this common library, you do have the ability to apply our native permissions and restrictions. So you're able to control not only who has access to the processes themselves, but then also the data that's associated with those processes as well. Uh, from here, like I mentioned, what I thought would be helpful is if we dive into one of these particular processes and start to build it out together uh, and see the step-by-step ways that you might be able to add in the additional uh, steps to a process. So I'll go ahead and click into this customer service feedback process. And when I do so, the first page that pops up is just my overview page. So similar to my home page, this is now at a detailed level, <clears throat> excuse me, for this particular process, where I can see all the active runs of this particular process, how many steps completed, how many were still active. I can filter the view so I can have, I can look at really what's going on from an operational standpoint, like Sean was mentioning earlier, within my process. From here, I'm actually gonna hop into this open builder page. And this brings me to our builder page. 
So within the builder page, you're really able to now start to add in the different steps of the process. How do you want that process to trigger? What do you want that process to do? What are the inputs? What are the outputs of this particular type of process? So anytime you want to kick off a process within Catalytic, the first thing you need to do is you need to add a trigger. So how do I want this process to begin? So if I click here into triggers and fields, I can start to add in the different types of triggers that we have available through our platform. So whether they are systematic, so something happening in another system, a field changing or an update occurring, uh, it could be when an email is received into a particular inbox, uh, it could be scheduled, so a particular process happening every day at a, at a certain time, that's an example. Reporting is a great example of that. Uh, Sean mentioned SFTP earlier, so if a new file is received into one of those uh, SFTP servers, we can grab it from there. It could even just be a web form where someone comes in, enters in some pieces of information, clicks on submit, and that's how we kick off the process. Let's say we wanted to go down the route of a web form. I'd go ahead and just click on web form. And the first thing that'll pop up is a help article, explaining to me how I can leverage this particular type of trigger, what are the inputs and what are the outputs. I can review that help article, see, yep, this is exactly what I want to use. And then I'll just click on add this trigger. When I click on add this trigger, it now brings me to our first build page where I can start to enter in exactly how I want this web form to appear. So let's say in this particular example, we wanna call this uh, the customer feedback uh, trigger. How do we, what's the description? Uh, customer submits inquiry or feedback to be resolved. Form title, let's again just call it customer feedback. Now we can start to enter in some instructions for, this, for the person who's entering or filling out this web form to view, to view the instructions as well. So let's just say, please um, complete the fields below prior to submitting. And then I can even designate a URL. So where do I want this form to live? Let's just call this customer feedback. You can see here in real time, it's starting to fill out that URL for me. If I just open this up in a new tab, I'll see that this URL isn't actually active yet. Uh, but the moment I click on save here in this web form, back in the builder view, and if I hop back into that web form I just opened up, again, just refresh it, I'll see now that this web form is live. And there's already a couple of fields there that I've previously entered that someone can come in, enter that information and click on submit to trigger this process. This web form itself is very customizable. So everything from the fields to the logo, you're able to customize it and, and make it relevant to the process that you might have. Let's say that I did want to change one of these fields or maybe I wanted to add in an additional question for this uh, customer to submit uh, within this process. How might I do so? So I'll go back into the builder view and if I scroll down here in the triggers and fields, you can start to see some of those fields that we had up on that web form. Let's say I wanted to add another one. I would just click on add a field. I would type in exactly what I want to ask. So maybe we want to ask them, uh, can we contact you for marketing purposes? That's exactly how I want it to be displayed. I can then designate what kind of type do I want this field to be? Do I want it to be a text field? Do I want it to be an instructions field? Maybe I want it to be a multiple choice, maybe even a file where I want somebody to upload a particular set of information for me to then ingest and process. Uh, let's say in this case, I wanted this to just be a choice field uh, where I could say yes and no. I could even start to enter in uh, validation. So depending on what, I, what someone enters into this field, there might be an error message that might pop up. Uh, and then I can even make this required. So I can ensure that every time somebody enters this, or every time somebody wants to complete this web form, they have to fill out this field before this web form can be submitted. Let's just say I toggle that on. I'll go ahead and click on save here. And then I'll just reorder this as well in, in, in the right way that I want it to be displayed. So let's say I just have it up here under your email address. If I wanted to get rid of a field, just the grayed out X to get rid of it. But now if I go back into the web form that we were just looking at and I click on fresh, you can see here now that that web form we just added in together is now there for me to select from along with the options that we were adding in. 
So it's that easy to start to put together those different pieces of a process and start to at least be able to figure out how do I want this process to begin? What are those different elements that I need to make sure are involved? But now that we've thought about how we want the process to trigger, how we want it to really kick off, we now need to think about what do we want this process to actually do? So that brings me to our actions. And actions are the building blocks of every single process here within Catalytic. So they are what are going, they allow you to then do the fully automated end-to-end -end process within uh, Catalytic. So for instance, in this example, once we submit the web form, the first step that we're taking is we're going to apply sentiment analysis to determine how positive or negative the customer feedback might be, leveraging one of our AI, AI capabilities. Now, based off of the scoring of that feedback, we're gonna automatically go one of two routes. So there is where your branching with the process might come into play, where you have your business logic that you need to apply within every single step of the process. In this scenario, what we're doing is if the feedback is negative, maybe we want to keep a person in the loop, in this case, a supervisor, allow them to review that information and manage that exception or escalation and determine, okay, what's the appropriate step that I need to take? So you can see that it might look something like this, where we say, hey, here's the feedback that we've received. How would you like to continue? If we wanted to, if the feedback was actually positive and we wanted to alert our sales team right away, we might leverage again one of our system integrations where we're going to automatically push this information out to our Slack channel and say, hey, sales team, great job. Here's some really positive feedback. So that might be how we want this process to begin. Uh, but let's say as we think about this process and we've seen a variety of different types of questions and inquiries and feedback that's come through, we've probably gathered all of this information somewhere, whether it's in another system or maybe it's offline in an Excel spreadsheet. How might I leverage all that different information and the data associated with this process back into this uh, automated workflow? That then brings me to our data tables. So our data tables are, our self, are your self-managed databases that live within Catalytic, where you have the ability to capture all the information around the process. So when was the process kicked off? What information was sent? What information was received? Where did it go? All of that gets stored in our data tables. So from a, from a compliance and audit perspective, you have a very clean trail as to what's going on within your process. Our data tables can also be leveraged where you are able to uh, upload uh, additional information from outside of Catalytic. So in this case, I had an Excel spreadsheet where I captured all of the different types of questions and answers that I might have had, and I uploaded that into Catalytic as well. Now these data tables are editable, so I can click here into the cell and I can start to enter information, I can change it, but just like the processes themselves, you have the ability to apply permissions and restrictions. So again, you can control who has read and write access to the information within these data tables. So the data table is a very powerful tool to leverage throughout the platform. Again, not only from an audit and compliance perspective, but also being able to leverage all the different pieces of information that live in different systems or even that you're gathering as a part of this process. Uh, but let's say within this particular example that we wanted to leverage this data table back into the process we were building. How might I actually do so? So I'm going to go back into our builder view here and I'm going to add a step to this process. And within this process, I want to look up similar types of questions or text to see, have, do we have a response that was already there that we can provide back to the customer? So I'm gonna type in exactly that what I, that what I want to do. So I'm gonna say, uh, look up similar question text and data table. So again, I'm just typing in exactly what I want to do. There's no coding that's involved here. I'm just gonna click on enter. And it's gonna leverage another element of our platform called natural language processing. So we have natively built in natural language processing or NLP, where we're now looking to see based off of the input that I'm providing and the step I wanna take, is there an action that exists today in our action library that matches up to what I'm looking to accomplish? If there is, it's gonna automatically grab that and bring that in here into the builder view for me to continue to configure and add it as the next step within my process. So this is where maybe it says, okay, you wanna look up data in a column, you can point it towards a data table that you would like to leverage. So maybe that frequently asked questions one, there's a drop down list, you can start searching for it. I can enter in what column I want to look up, what the search term might be, and what information I even want to return. And then just like with every single step within a process, you have the ability to add in conditions and dependencies. So conditions again being those if then statements, the business logic behind every single step within a process. So if this is occurring, then I want this step within the process to happen as well. 
And then dependency is dependencies being, I want this step to occur after the step within the process has completed. So again, being able to automatically and easily apply the different business logic that is occurring within a process. Uh, but let's say that this action that it found isn't the action that I want to leverage. How might I be able to change that? How can I see all the different types of actions that might be there for me to leverage? I can click here into the action type. And the first thing that happens is you start to see a drop down list of the different types of actions that are available for me to, to use. I can start to scroll through them and I can say, okay, I can select from one of these. Maybe I just want to search for one. I can start to type it in and it'll start to filter that list. Or maybe I can just, if I want to view all of the actions that I have, I'll click here on view all actions. And when I click on view all actions, it brings me to our action library. where You can start to see all of the thousands of actions that we have that are split out into what we call these different modules of capabilities. So you can see here on a module by module basis, what are you trying to accomplish? Sean alluded to some of these in his presentation as well. But for instance, if I wanted to look at some of the data processing um, abilities, I can click into the data processing module and start to see all the different types of actions that we might have around processing data. If I wanted to see integrations, for example, I can click into integrations and I can see all of the out of the box integrations that we have today with different systems that I might want to leverage and we might have actions around them as well. Or maybe I want to leverage something like SFTP drops or even API actions where I want to get, post, put, patch or delete information. I can click on API actions and I can start to leverage those as well. So we have the ability to really make it easy to navigate and to bring in all these different elements of a process into an easy to digestible or an easy, easy to digest and use view. Um, let's say I wanted to search for a particular action like I was earlier, in this case, that similar text action. I'll just search for it. I'll go ahead and select it. And just like with the trigger earlier, the first thing that pops up is a help article. Again, explaining to me what are the inputs, what are the outputs, how can I leverage this particular action within my process? I can read through it and say, yes, this is exactly what I want to use. Click on use this action. And again, it'll st I can start to configure this action out as the next step within my process. Uh, now let's say within this particular process, now that we've looked up the question text and we, and we found something that matches up, maybe we want to automatically reach back out to the customer uh, with that response. How might I do that? So just like the previous step where I just typed in exactly what I want to accomplish, I'm gonna do that same thing here where I'm gonna say send email to customer with response. So I'll go ahead and type that in, I'll click on enter. And again, using natural language processing, it's identified that there's an action in our library that matches up to what I'm looking to accomplish. It's automatically brought that in. And you should see here that this action, just like the one above it, is just as easily configurable, well, where when you're sending an email, these fields, fields should look familiar. Where is it going? What's the subject? What's the body? Are there attachments? Do you want to track if, they're, if this email is even opened or not? And then again, just like the previous step, you have the ability to add in those conditions and dependencies and that business logic around every single step. Uh, now let's say within this particular process, I wanted to um, log the information that's coming through into my CRM tool. Maybe I have Salesforce, for instance, and I, wanted to, and I want to create a case anytime an inquiry comes in, I wanna make sure I log that in my CRM tool along with how it's getting stored in Catalytic in our data tables. Uh, let's say I go ahead and just type in again, create case in Salesforce. Again, leveraging natural language processing, I'm just typing in exactly what I want to accomplish. It's looking to see, is there an action that matches up to what I'm looking to do? Looks like there is. And it automatically brought that in for me to start to leverage and use as a part of my process. So again, being able to leverage those different elements of the platform where you're able to connect the people, the data and the systems around any process and bringing them into an easy to use and easy to configure way. Uh, from here, I'm gonna hop into our settings page. And when I click into settings, this brings me to kind of the final layer of what's going on behind the scenes. This is where I can start to designate the workflow name. So what do I, what I wanna call this process? What's the description? Is there anything I want to add or change to this, to, to this particular process? Maybe I want to assign a category. So where does this process live? Does it live within a particular team, within a particular line of business? I can designate that. 
I can even designate the owner. So maybe I'm building this process today, but I want Sean to own it moving forward. I can designate the owner for, the, for that process moving forward as well. And then you can start to see the different elements around the data tables. So what are the data tables that we're leveraging, the information that's being captured? Are there any additional workflows that are a part of this process that I want to bring in as well? And then security. So I can, again, control who has access to edit this process and the data around it. Um, I can even apply these types of updates retroactively and have a data retention policy as well. So you can control how long this data is being stored. So all of these different elements make it easy for someone to control and build out a process within Catalytic. Uh, the final piece that I want to show you all as well, uh, and, and Sean mentioned this earlier, and this is our insights page. So now that you have the process, you've digitized the process, you've automated the process, but to Sean's point, you want to continuously improve on this process. Now, how might I leverage all this data that we're capturing around these processes that are running within Catalytic? The first way is through these individual insights page for every single process. So for every single process within the platform, you're able to look at what's the cycle time trend, what are those potential bottlenecks within the, the process itself. So this again is broken out on an action by action basis. So you're able to see step by step what's taking the longest time and how can I potentially improve upon this process. And again, allowing you to continuously improve and provide value back to the business. Uh, so I'm going to pause there and see if there's any specific questions or, or Sean, if you thought there might be another element that you want to make sure that we touch upon um, as well within this overview. Maybe one quick thing, because I do see that there's some questions around where we use AI. Um, and so there are a number of AI actions. And I think Nasser has uh, shown like one sitting here in front of us is a sentiment analysis. So when you look at all of our categories, a number of the actions that we use are using uh, machine learning, natural language processing, or OCR. So like we have OCR as an action. Uh, another use of AI is uh, something we use within the system. So it could be the case of natural language processing, which we use to decrease the need for people to memorize all the reference information about the actions. We also use machine learning to help drive the uh, operational insights that Nasser pointed out under insights. And then we also use, uh, or we make, machine learning available for people to be able to train their own machine learning models through something we call predictive models. So all these fields that are popping up on the right hand side, you can try to build a machine learning model that predicts uh, future values. And that becomes really useful when you're trying to build up something like an approval workflow. Right, so if you're trying to do approvals, it's really easy to build a machine learning model that says, here are all the inputs, is this likely going to get approved or not? Or you can build something that is like a flight risk, right? Based on the performance inputs, uh, is this candidate or is this employee going to be at risk for leaving? So it makes machine learning very easy to build in our application and, and then to use within workflow. Um, but I, I saw that, so I thought we could kind of chime in on that. But let's pause a little bit and see if there are any new questions or if we just want to kind of run through some of these questions. These are, these are some great questions, and so I, I definitely want to uh, address some of them. Thank you, Nasir. That was a great demo. I think uh, it's wonderful. <clears throat> Here are my thoughts uh, initially, um, Sean and Nasir. So I think great tool. I think. Um, I know this is the first no code, real no code platform that I'm seeing. People do talk about low code, no code, but this is a real no code platform that I'm seeing. <clears throat> and you lead with uh, people. Like I saw you lead with forms. And again, I think that's a differentiator. I'm, you know, so this is built not for developers. This is built for actual people who can do it. It's built for people and it's for uh, you, know, you know, it uses data uh, as one of the key things and, you know, you get to insights and analytics. So I think that's uh, really exciting to see. I think this is a, a different platform from what I've seen earlier, from the things I've seen earlier, because they are built for developers. <laughs> and then they say you can also citizen develop. So they say citizen developers. <clears throat> but I think the whole citizen developer itself is a myth. Uh, we need citizens who can develop or, you know, uh, people who can develop. Yeah. Right. Um, so uh, that that's great. And um, uh, <clears throat> so one question I had um, just to start off is that um, so this is 
great no code stuff and i i think it reaches a lot of areas it's got a lot of actions uh, for for this one um now supposing that people need to get to a little bit more complex thing like in an ocr you did an ocr and then you need to do you know you need to pick out data which has got some complex rules um, is it uh, are you able to address that yeah yeah absolutely so what we didn't show and and we could probably jump in and show is how you can stitch together uh a lot of complexity in actions and the data that you're pulling from one action is available for use by any other action so if i start if i apply let's say um let's say the first action i get is to send out a form to you and then to ask for you to submit your driver's license you know and you take a picture of the driver's license and then that comes in and that's action 1 action 2 might be we're going to use OCR and scan that driver's license and then now the the scanned text will be available for use within the rest of the action so the third action might be now I'm going to look for the driver's license state and driver license number right so all these things are actually very very simple to stitch together that would literally be four actions to create and then let's say the fifth one is i just now want to enter it into your table like that would be five actions and you would be able to do that relatively complex sequence and then you can layer in a lot more complexity so you might want to start layering in conditionals hey i couldn't find a state couldn't find a valid driver's license so i'm going to send out a notification and bring in a person or i'm going to send out a form again and loop until i find uh, legit information Right, so it's actually very easy to construct things that are going to batch, that are conditionals, that are uh, good at exception handling. You mentioned one of the things we lead with is uh, people, and we find that to be very true. In fact, that's really how we started. You know, when when I go back to my description of how I'm like a operations nerd and an operations geek, operations pre RPA was really about making people work efficiently together and some of the questions that your your uh, participants have submitted are things like how is catalytic different than RPA uh and and a good way to think about that is the the way in which we are similar to RPA and many other players is we are all committed to the idea of automating work right and and we're all committed to the idea that people do and spend a lot of their time doing things that are really kind of bad use of people time data entry you know pivoting information like that's just not good use of people time and in that sense i feel like we're very um we're very mission aligned with rpa we're very mission aligned with a number of other players the difference though is that RPA is really constructing kind of a surface automation view so there you're creating a bot that's operating on an existing desktop environment right and you might virtualize that and put it into a VM whereas on our platform it started with the idea of how do we make people be able to work efficiently together so just all the tasks and then how do we take chunks of work that they're doing as part of these workflows and automate those tasks uh so when you look at something that master did that could have been entirely people like a task here and then a task to look this up in a database and then another task to re-enter it right but those are the tasks that actually get automated really easily now on our platform there's no bot concept so when you construct something you're building it in the cloud there's no infrastructure you need it's all running in the cloud so it lends itself extremely well for working with people outside of the firewall it, you know we we see a lot of supply chain cases procurement cases hr cases uh customer operations cases where we're directly interacting with people outside of the four walls of the boundary or the four walls of the firewall uh corporation because you're building like a real digital solution right so that's that's one way in which it's different i think the other way um it it differs is that we are at our core an orchestration engine and someone uh submitted uh, a question saying um something like they i think they saw uh automation anywhere like we integrate to automation anywhere and we also integrate to ui path uh and then not officially but we do also integrate to blue prism and we're happy to integrate to the other rpa uh, uh players outside of those main three uh to me 
because we are primarily an orchestration engine, uh, I, I really think of us as orchestrating people, data, and systems. And I think of bots as essentially a system that we can orchestrate, right? So you can actually have a task or you can have a workflow that starts with a person entering a form and then going and manipulating a spreadsheet and then handing it off to a UiPath bot and that UiPath bot will enter data into a green screen. Okay, perfect, perfect. That, that that's good to know. I think that's a great vision. Um, uh, and and as as you know, you reemphasize that it's people first, and I, I really love that part of it. Um, I, I I I just wanted to still again compare with an RPA because that's the popular question with people. <laughs> so yeah. uh, one question the people would have in their mind is, uh, um, you know, RPA you can extend with some coding. Um, but here I'm thinking you don't want to do that. Is that right? Well, you know, we don't lead with that because our vision really is kind of impact, but we do have an SDK and we also have a product called Workbench. So SDK allows you to essentially have embedded catalytic. And when we think about, uh, like I'm a developer, like that, that's what, you know, I was the CTO at Bill Glass and the CEO, but I started really as like a developer and one of the things that I always found to be kind of a pain in the butt is all that backend stuff, right? Like approvals and workflows and integrations. Like right. that was the thing that excited me. So you can use our SDK to act as an embedded back end engine. So you can just focus on creating front end activity and then have all that stuff using leveraging our engine. So that's one thing that we provide to developers. The other thing though, and I think this may be closer to what you're asking is, let's say you want to build a custom action that's very unique to your company. You, you have a proprietary scoring mechanism, you have a proprietary system that you want to interact with, you know, whatever it is, you have a proprietary file format. You can use Workbench to create things that interact with on-prem systems. And you can also use Workbench to create custom actions that then you can upload to your team so that the business users can actually use those actions. So you can extend our platform. You can add to that list of actions that you saw with Workbench. So the role of developers in kind of our universe is really about leveraging and extending developers. Like they don't have to build everything from scratch every time. Right. You know, they're incredibly scarce resources. We want to make sure that they're able to extend the platform and make their colleagues without the development skills be able to actually be a lot more effective. Okay, that's great. So what would they use? What skills would they need if they need to develop on the Workbench? So Workbench today supports C Sharp. And uh, I think we have C Sharp and JavaScript and Python are the main ones that we have right now. Java is coming online next. Uh, same on the SDK or yeah, same on the SDK side. Okay. That's great. So um, let's just get to the questions here. Um, so one of the questions was uh, DPA versus RPA. So I think you are in a unique position to answer that. You are slotted as RPA yeah. and now you think, now you are positioning as DPA. So what do you think yeah. of the relationship? Well, I, I, first of all, I don't think that they're mutually exclusive. I, I think many companies will find themselves using uh, multiple technologies. Oh. You know, we certainly position ourselves as something that's also very accessible for smaller companies. And in a smaller company, we might be all that they need. So we do want to be an end-to-end -end solution. We want to be able to encompass most of the needs of most companies. Um, but the difference in my mind of those categories, keeping in mind also that many players don't play in a single category, right? Yeah. Like Pekka is, they, they kind of are a DPA category, but they obviously also have an RPA tool. We, even though we view ourselves primarily as sitting in our in, in DPA, we have browser automation, you know, UiPath, uh, which is, you know, a very much considered an RPA tool, does also have some capabilities and they're extending their capability footprint to start doing things like process mining and all that stuff. All right, so vendors versus categories. I'm gonna set aside the vendors, I'm gonna focus on the categories. Okay. The category of DPA to me is essentially the revitalized BPM category. So BPM, you know, business process management, of which PEG is one of the oldest, biggest ones, right. is mostly 
kind of a failed industry in my mind. Like it, it didn't really, it's super promising and people were very excited about it. It just never really took off to the extent that it needed to. And so DPA is kind of like the new take on it. Uh, and it's really focused on making people efficient and working with each other. Orchestration is at the heart of a lot of DPA products. Um, and then you see a lot of specialized one. Like I, I actually would categorize ServiceNow as essentially a very uh, specialized DPA that is really focused around ITSM. You know, and, and I like ServiceNow. I think it's a great tool. Um, RPA, on the other hand, pure RPA is really all about surface automation. So it's, it's, you know, like we were talking about, it's kind of the evolution of Selenium or Rational Robot, but with a lot more enterprise grade capabilities, a lot more monitoring capabilities, a lot more smarts on top of it. But these obviously are very, very different things. One is designed to make people work better together. The other is designed to pretend to be a person in front of a computer, right? Both have very useful parts of the enterprise tech stack. Yeah, so that's an interesting point about BPM, <clears throat> and I too consider, you know, and, and many people have said that BPM is dead, but then people also say RPA is dead, so <laughs> <laughs> you can't uh, believe either. <clears throat> so, but... <clears throat> you know, tell that to the investors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't die or it doesn't live, but, uh, you know, it's a gradient, right? I mean, so yeah, BPM has been used lesser and lesser. So yes. in your mind, um, why did BPM fail? And, um, you know, how is BPA making it better? So BPM and another category is very, very similar called uh, EAI, Enterprise Application Integration. Those two categories fundamentally failed because they were too hard. You know, I mean, I, I've been a technologist for a long time and I uh, implemented Vitria way back in the day. Uh, and I implemented uh, Pega way back in the day. I mean, Pega, most people don't realize how old Pega really is. I think mm -hmm. they started in like early 90s or something. It's a pretty old company. Right. Um, and they were really just, they're just too hard. They're super expensive, really hard to implement, really hard to maintain. So you're able to get some momentum, but it's very, very hard to get any sort of scale and it's very hard and expensive to maintain. And they also came at a time before API first was a concept. So they, they almost came at a time when everyone was focused on client server technologies and the whole web thing wasn't really mature enough for them to leverage. So the new versions of all of those, and the reason why I think they're going to be more successful, why we're going to be more successful is because we're built in a different era. We're not built in the era of client servers. We're built in an era where everything is API first, where everything is you know, advanced, like the technology has evolved enough now from our perspective that we can actually lower the barrier to entry in terms of how hard it is to build something, right? And we couldn't have done that cost effectively back in the mid nineties. But today, natural language processing is dirt cheap. We don't have to build every single capability because it is an API first world. We have capability ecosystem partners. So Google Vision and Azure provide the OCR capabilities. You know, we can leverage uh, machine learning from Amazon, from IBM Watson. All of those capabilities are accessible. Our value add is not creating that primary type of research, but making it easy to use and easy to configure. Right, so it's kind of a different world. And uh, the, the, to us, the no code aspect is the, is the transformational thing. It is the thing that will take it out of the realm of inaccessible, low impact into meaningful impact. Great, great, great. And, um, and the analog, by the way, for EAI, which we also speak a lot to, is iPaaS. So Vitria, Web Methods, Tibco, all of those things are like, they're still there. Like companies use them, right? Just like a lot of companies still use Pega. But if you had to pick a new platform from scratch today, you know, I don't know that those would be the most logical picks. You would probably pick someone like a MuleSoft or you might pick, you know, like there are better iPaaS companies now. So they're, they're kind of like the new version. Yeah. 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 Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Um, interesting points there. So I have personally also worked on EAI, yeah. <laughs> TIPCO, so I'm aware of this. So I think you have two interesting points. You said technology uh, has progressed. And then I think also the development is progressing towards no code. 
to interesting points. One more thing I think is about the whole uh, concept of BPM. Uh, it's been like boiling the ocean, right? <laughs> Let's do all the process from end to end. And then it's a multi-year project, multi-million dollar project. And it's all IBM, Oracle. And I think that has changed uh, now yeah. because uh, people can't wait for so long. And that's one reason I think RPA is popular because you can do things in months uh, or weeks. Yeah. They saw a project where EY is doing a project for one of the states where they're doing uh, the whole employment claims processing within a month, four weeks. Uh, and, and at $7.5 million, but that's that's a different point, but yeah. <laughs> they're yeah. doing it in one month. Um, so yeah, I think I think uh, it's a different world, and you know now is a time to be agile and do things, you know, give give out uh, you know outcome based uh, things yeah. to the customers. Yeah, you need to see gains fast. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think one of the things that's really rewarding about the newer platforms, you know, and, and, and a thing that we focus a lot on is you can you can iterate very quickly. Like you saw, Nasser iterated like right in front of right in front of us, right? And, and we talk about even doing live stuff, right? You can iterate that quickly um, and you can see results very quickly. And I think that's really important in today's environment. It's, it's not even fast results, which obviously is important, but even, you know, seeing steady visible progress toward those rapid results is really important. And uh, most of the platforms that are more successful today, I think are showing signs of that. Good, good. So question about, um, you know, again, relating to an RPA world, can this be run like in an unattended mode? Uh, can it be run in the background when people are already working on the computers? Uh, how does it work? That's a great question. And that's actually one of, because we're not RPA, that's not even actually, if you had asked me that, in 2016, when we started Catalytic, before I knew what RPA was, I would be like, I don't understand the question, right? right? Because the idea of a desktop client never actually entered our mind. Uh, and so the, the simple answer to that is, yes, you can absolutely work on your desktop. And it's because we don't have a bot that runs on your desktop. So you're building something in a browser, and then it's running in a multi-tenant or private tenant environment in the cloud somewhere. So there's complete... Uh, separation between what you're building on your desktop and your browser and where it runs, right? It's, it's actually running somewhere else. One of the nice things about our platform is you don't have to have any additional infrastructure. There's no provisioning. You don't have to worry about a separate desktop. You don't have to worry about building something on a desktop and then porting it over to a server and hoping that the environment's the exact same. So the bot works the way that you built it on your desktop. You know, that sort of thing just doesn't exist. And, and, in many ways, I'm kind of surprised that that actually does exist at all because that seems so 1990s to me, you know, <laughs> but, but I think that's just an artifact of the way RPA works, right? It's just like, it's because it's desktop automation. Right. Okay. Um, so stepping into some practical aspects, um, do you have a community edition for Catalytic that people can use? We have a community and then we are we have just launched a trial edition so we do have a guided trial that people can go through and it's you know like obviously free um and we're about to launch a community edition so come probably um i don't know maybe end of july or august but it will be soon that we're going to launch a full-on community edition we do want developers to come on even though we're no code and low code you know i i, I think you've seen that in the hands of a developer no code doesn't mean inefficient it means even or it doesn't mean a mismatch it means they're even more efficient than they yeah. like a developer working on a no-code platform is like a 10x developer right so there's a lot of value for developers we want developers we want other uh, business users to be able to come on and learn on our platform in a way where they don't have to at a corporate level buy uh, a, a license that way they can kind of build up the business case um, you know in, in real time on our platform if any, if anyone on wants to be notified about when the community edition is available, just you know, ping me. Let me know. And we'll be happy to make, make sure that you get a notification when it does become available. Okay, great. Um, 
So uh, would would uh, people be able to access the workbench part also, and then able to would they be able to create new actions? Uh, also, um, do you are you planning to create a like a library where people can contribute to yes. actions? Yes. So we have all the infrastructure for library. We didn't we didn't show this to you, but there's when you go to create a new workflow, there's a showcase. And that showcase pulls from something that we right now curate. Um, but in the community, you can upload uh, workflows. So there's a, a forum that's, I can't remember the name of the forum, but there's a forum on our community where people can, you can export any of your workflows and it'll export everything. And then you can, you have a file that you can then post to um, the forum. So people can share things already, uh, entire workflows, not just an action. And the cool thing about our um, actions is you can extend our platform using Workbench to create a custom action, but you can actually take a workflow and save it as an action too. So you can create a lot of things on our platform. Um, and what we see is, you know, people creating things with like API actions, and then they'll save that as an action. So let's say we don't have an action right now that talks to, you know, Contentful. I, I can go in there and I can use API actions because it's a clean API to have, uh, to let's say enter data into Contentful. And then I can save that workflow as an action. And then from my team's perspective, it's just a new action, right? right? So people will be able to use that. I have not, like we have not worked through all the logistics on how we'll make Workbench available. So it likely won't be available initially in the community edition. Uh, only because we we have like a little bit more thinking to go through there. People can actually access um, a lot of this information already without an account. Like you can go to help.catalytic.com that has all of our actions on there. You can go to developers.catalytic.com and that will tell you a little bit about the SDK. It doesn't have as much info in there on the workbench yet, but all of that documentation is available. Okay, and as the community grows, you know, like UiPath Go or Blue Prism VX, you know, you, you never know what developers can come up with, you know, a lot of okay. actions which can extend the... Totally. I'm, I'm very excited about the idea. I mean, an ecosystem is really core to the way we think about our platform. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm super excited about opening up uh, things. And, and we do actually, in our showcase, we do have some uh, implementation partners that have uh, contributed to the showcase. So uh, FSOP, which is an invoice processing uh, company, uh, they've con they've just contributed something. Uh, Grant Thornton, which is one of our implementation partners, has uh, is they're about to contribute a number of things. I think Cap Gemini is actually about to contribute a number of things. So those will be exciting. Okay, perfect, very good. Um, probably not a very popular question with some vendors, but um, I don't know. You uh, do you have a transparent pricing options? What we're going to have transparent pricing options. So mm -hmm. I won't even answer it now because we're going to put it on the website. So mm -hmm. you'll be able to just come in and look at the website, but that will probably launch, uh, that will probably go in uh, like middle of this month. So it will be soon. Oh. Okay. Yep. yep. We want, I'm, I'm committed to transparent pricing. I hate opaque enterprise pricing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I mean, I recognize that enterprise pricing is still necessary. So we'll still probably have that call us now. Thing, and that really just represents, you know, we don't know what you need us to do as an enterprise. So if you need us to set up a special data center in Germany because you don't, you can't have it anywhere else, obviously that pricing is going to be different. But we're going to have very transparent pricing for most companies and most people will be able to figure out their own pricing. Yeah, that will be great because that's one problem with RPS space with a lot of yeah. fixed spacing, a lot of different kinds of licensing. Um, you name it. And, well, you know. I'll say a unique feature of our pricing model, um, which we've emphasized, you know, uh, the automation space talks a lot about the long tail of business processes, right? Like I'm sure you, you and all your uh, uh, listeners here have heard the term, the long tail of business processes. And the problem with the long tail of the business processes is if you have a unit based price that scales linearly, or even if there's a volume discount as you have each, additional process come on, there's a floor that you've established where if your process can't be optimized below or above that floor, you just won't do it. 
So there's actually no way to get to the long tail of the business pricing because your business model restricts it. So we've been very intentional and we've also had the benefit of being, you know, a very new company. So we, we've been able to think about the pricing model and we've constructed a pricing model that is, that allows for unlimited use. And because we're also cloud-based, it's actually a lot easier for us to do. So the idea of the unlimited use model, of course, is that you will be able to get to that long tail because the marginal costs of, you know, your 100th workflow is going to be, uh, from a vendor licensing, like what you pay at Catalytic will be effectively zero, right? Because you've already kind of paid for it in your first 100. So in your next 100, it's effectively zero. Now there's people time, so you still have to take that into consideration. But it really allows, it's, it's like, to the best of my knowledge, it's the only pricing model that allows for true uh, pursuit of the long tail of business processes. Yeah, and I, and I like that you're thinking about it, right? Because otherwise it becomes more of a business case and then you just can't go beyond a certain number of, and that's probably one of the reasons it's difficult to scale with RPA. And also RPA is based on number of bots, many of the RPA at least, and you don't have that concept or constraint. So that's, no. that's good to know. All right. So one last question before we go, because the times that we are in the COVID uh, and, you know, so what, and the changes and, you know, we're getting into a new normal. So what do you see as the new normal and how do you see what's happening right now in the automation space? And how do you see that evolve with the new normal? That's a great question. Uh, actually, strangely, or, or I guess, you know, serendipitously, I'm going to be moderating a panel. I don't know when, but it's an IQPC, it's Intelligent Automation Week panel that is going to be talking about this. And it's got some great fellow panelists. It's like someone from Visa, someone from USAA, someone from uh, BNY. And so, you know, great enterprise brands, really experienced people. We're going to be talking about this exact topic. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll say here that uh, one of the biggest things to think about is COVID has been a, both a catalyst and an excuse for re, redesigning your organization, right? Like the world's going to change or has changed and it's actually not going to go back to normal. We don't know what it's going to go back to, um, but it's been the perfect forcing function to redesign organizations. And you know, all the people who've been trying to and haven't been able to redesign their organizations for whatever reasons now have like the perfect cover. And when you redesign your organization with today's technology, you're gonna think automation at the core, right? And, and that's different because now you're not trying to layer in automation on top of a whole bunch of people and you're like just trying to figure out how do I actually sort out this mess. Today you have, bit of a period, a spot of time where you can say, what is my organization? Like, what's the most sensible organization that I can construct and use automation heavily? And then, you know, kind of layer the people on top of that because it's not, few businesses are want to get rid of all their people, but a lot of businesses have a bunch of people doing things that don't make a lot of sense. Right. And so this is a unique moment in time for people to get very aggressive about thinking about their design of their organizations. Um, the other thing I think that's really interesting, it's beneficial for us, um, is that the people orchestration side of automation, what RPA players would call things like human in the loop or uh, attended automation, like that notion becomes more critical than ever when you have a distributed workforce. And so for us, because we're so people first and people centric, it's very natural to actually have a distributed workforce receive tasks and they don't have to worry about the handoff. So our product actually eases the fact that people are no longer right next to each other and can just kind of shout over, like, I don't have to shout over, hey, Nasser, you know, I just sent that over to you. Can you take a look at it? Right, because those tasks now are orchestrated by our platform. Great, great, great. Yeah, great time to redesign and great time to redesign with people first, right? And yeah, uh, yeah. automation at the core and really, you know, what's a distributed work? Like our company is going, like I'm sure many, we're going remote first. So when we go back, you know, we're going to be remote first. And, and I think many companies will be. Right, right. Great. And on, on, on that note, I think it's a good 
time to end. Uh, thank you, Sean, for doing this. Thank you for spending time with us. Uh, uh, Nasser, thanks for the demo. Thanks all for joining. <clears throat> and before we go, Sean um, and Nasser, if you can share some of the resources that you spoke about on the call, uh, like your help site and your, you know, whatever you want to share, as well as maybe the IQPC thing. So if people want to attend that. Uh, Great. That. So yeah. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone. I'll see you on the next one. Thank you. Thank you, Nan.